I sang that song for more than 60 years, a song of praise to Joseph Smith, the prophet of the Restoration and founder of the LDS Church, the church I served as a bishop for five years. I knew the church was true. I was a faithful Latter-day Saint. My life has been built on certain truths, but wishing doesn't change the truth. Jesus said, you shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. When I finally learned the truth about the real history and doctrines of Mormonism, I realized that I was following the gospel of Joseph Smith and not the gospel of Jesus Christ. I have come to learn that many others have made a similar journey out of the bondage of religion and into an authentic relationship with Jesus. And that's what this show is all about. Courageous people who want to share their story, hoping that you, the viewer, will discover the same new life in Jesus. So if you're a Latter-day Saint who is struggling with questions or seeking a genuine encounter with the Savior, we invite you to join us tonight. We have a joyful message that we want to share with you. Good evening and welcome to the Ex-Mormon Files here in the heart of Salt Lake City. I'm your host, Bishop Earl, and I appreciate you uh, being with us tonight and we're for our second interview with Bill McKeever. Appreciate you still being here. Thank, Thank you. you. And we've sure got a lot to cover and we covered a few things last week and learned uh, a little more of Bill's personal uh, story and also his passion for the Mormons and, and what, uh, so I'd, I'd kind of like to begin right there. You started a ministry in California, right? We did. It was uh, in 1979 and mainly it was to educate the body of Christ about mm. the differences between Mormonism and Christianity as well as to reach out to Latter-day Saints whenever we had an opportunity to talk to them one-on-one. -on -one. God, God put so. this on your heart to do that? You've, I know there's a lot of Mormons in California, there right? Are Quite a few, yeah. especially in San Diego County. Yeah. Uh, they built a temple there in 1993, yeah. so there are a lot of Mormons in that area. And is, is I just had a passion uh, for the Mormon people. Now I know it's common among Latter-day Saints to to assume that the reason why you decided to uh, speak specifically to the Mormon people is there must have been some bad thing that happened in your life <laughs> to cause you to somebody, want to get back at them that yeah. way. I've been asked that many times. Somebody you know, offended did some, you? Did somebody, somebody offend you or you know, what happened? Yeah. And many assumed that I was a Latter-day Saint yeah. and, and feel that maybe I had a run-in with a bishop or a personality problem. And that, of course, that is not the case at all with me. Mm -hmm. And as I've said many times, I had nothing but good experiences growing up with my LDS friends, even though we never really discussed religious issues. Yeah. That didn't really happen until after I started, uh, after I became a Christian. But it was my desire to, to speak to the Mormons, I, I kind of put it this way. Why is it when a Christian feels called to, let's say, go to China, Everybody goes, oh, that's noble, that's oh. great. He has such a love, such a compassion for the Chinese people. Isn't it wonderful that he'd want to give his life to talk to those people? Or Africa, yeah, you know, the African so people. Isn't that great? But missions. yet when you say, well, I, I feel called to talk to the Mormons. Oh, do you hate them? <laughs> you know, what? No. You know, why, why, can't, yeah, why can't we have that same kind of compassion for the Mormon people? I don't understand that. And I've used that analogy with Latter-day Saints. I, I hope it kind of gets them to see to make them think a little where bit. I'm coming from. Yeah. But it's naturally assumed by, I think, far too many Latter-day Saints because they are raised with this persecution complex, <laughs> you know, that everybody's against them. That yeah. To think that anybody who wants to talk to them about yeah. issues of eternal consequence, and the, really that's what drives me because I do believe when I read the New Testament that there are consequences for believing false doctrine. And we're warned it, about that con continually. Exactly. False Christ, Paul places false a very strong emphasis, if you read his pastoral epistles, on you know, watch your life and doctrine closely. He's always emphasizing the, the importance of doctrine in the life of the Christian, because I think he's right to the extent that you know, bad doctrine usually results many times in bad behavior. Yeah. Now a Mormon hearing that's going to go, whoa, wait a minute, my doctrine makes me a good person. Well, you might think that, but really if you're believing a, 
in doctrine that is not truthful, that is not from God, does that really honor God to believe something that is a theological lie? I've asked Mormons it's a that tough question. question. Yeah. And even Mormons will admit that believing something that is false does not honor God. That is really the whole basis for what I do. I, I want to get the Mormon to think about what they have been led to believe, yeah. see if what they are led to believe conforms to reality, because that's what truth is, yeah. that which conforms to reality. Right. If it doesn't conform to reality, it needs to be rejected. It's as simple as that. Kind of the bad tree producing good fruit kind of thing. Yes. And, yeah. And many times, Mormons will look at their goodness, yeah. and I'm not doubting that many Mormons are very good people. Yeah. Uh, there's no doubt in my mind about that. But sadly, though, and you can probably testify to this, or all that, many times their goodness gets in their way. Yeah. And oh, they often there's such a pride. look to their, yes, such they look to their goodness, yeah. and they fail to see how they have actually come short yeah. of the glory of God. Wow. And of course, I think that's what we as Christians should be striving uh, to accomplish when we talk to our Mormon friends, is to get them to see that they still have a huge need in their life, that even though they are trying so hard to be good people, they will never be good enough. Yeah. A and yeah. A, a lot of Latter-day Saints, I think, do at some point come to that conclusion in their life, and then they live with the guilt that yeah. comes with that. Trying to be worthy. And if they're, and if they're living under guilt, yeah. you can easily tell they're living under law, because guilt is the product of living under law. Yeah. You don't keep the law, you're guilty for it. Back to what we were talking about and last week exactly. about being forgiven. And, and, and so I think it's important that when we talk with our Latter-day Saints, that we need to um, empathize with them that, you know, we're not saying that we're better than they are. No, we're not yeah. saying that at all. Although, I have found from experience that many of them assume that we think they're, we're better oh, than sure. them because when they ask us, for instance, if we have the assurance that we are forgiven of our sins, they naturally assume that what we're saying is, is that we have accomplished everything they have yet to accomplish. Oh. Because, you know, in Mormonism, forgiveness comes at the end. Yeah. Whereas in Christianity, forgiveness comes, comes at, the, at beginning. the beginning. And so I remember having a conversation with a Latter-day Saint down on the streets of Manti, and I was asking him about where he is in light of eternity and if he knew for sure he was forgiven of his sins. And naturally, he was not sure. So he turned it around, and I'm used to this, and he asked me if I was sure that I was forgiven. And I said, absolutely. And immediately he said that I was the most arrogant person he had ever met. And, uh, <laughs> I, Not understanding I could be to all. a certain extent, yeah. I don't know. But I understood exactly what he meant by that. I do and too. so I, I usually make it a point when I say that to say, okay, now I know what you're thinking. Yeah. You're probably thinking, I'm a very arrogant person because I have that assurance. But yet, let me just calm your fears on that. The only reason I have that assurance is not because of what I have accomplished. I, yeah. It has everything to do with what, it, what Jesus accomplished for me on the cross at Calvary isn't and my trust in what he did. Wonderful message, isn't it? It's I so mean, basic that, and simple. Yeah. And I think if I can get that across to a Latter-day Saint, I, I think they, they start to see something there. Yeah. And I know it's very common for Mormons to look at evangelicals as being arrogant because of that assurance. But and that's why I think it's important that we need to explain to them where that assurance comes from. Right, it comes from if it had anything to do with me, I would right. never have that assurance. Yeah. There's just no way. Now you were running a radio program and a call-in show in California. And, and we did. Where does Eric Johnson come in with all this? Well, uh, I was asked to be a guest on a, an hour and a half radio <laughs> call-in show really? on a Christian station in San Diego about 15 or 10 minutes before the show was to start, the host calls the station saying, I can't make it, can you go on by yourself? And you just took the whole hour and a half? Well, I had no choice. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, it was, it was either that or go home. Yeah. And so I, I went, you know, like, you're kidding me. He said, no, I can't make it, can you do, it's an hour and a half show. I said, well, okay. Oh, yeah. So he gave me, he gave me a tip. He said, in the, before the show goes on, 
go call some of your friends and have and them call, call in. So you know their friends. I said, like, okay. So I called a couple of friends and said, look, this is, this is what I have to do. <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing here. I've never done this before. And uh, so I, I think one friend called in. Yeah. And that wasn't going to take us for the whole hour no. and a half. But it ended up I got through that. Yeah. I've never listened to that show again. Uh -huh. I probably should go back yeah. and, and hear how horrible it probably was. So you organized MRM. In uh -huh. 1979, was the calling show before that? No, it was actually after. after that. It was in uh, the late 80s. I think it was around 1988 oh. when okay. it, all this happened. Uh, after being a guest on that particular show a couple more times, the the host was going to move to another station and wanted to know if I was interested in taking over the slot. It ultimately ended up that we were on Saturdays for an hour. Okay, and I did it by myself for a while and then Eric came along I think in 1889 where did 1989 he, was he just a neighbor or someone in the he, he was a Christian? friend and we both had a mutual friend oh. Peter Barnes who was a former Jehovah's Witness oh. and uh, we really got to know each other at Peter's rededication wedding ceremony okay. and uh, <laughs> so we started talking and really hit it off very well and uh, I think at that time Eric was going to seminary in San oh. Diego and a uh, Christian seminary, not Another Mormon seminary. Another great friendship comes about, huh? Yeah, well, we hit it off, and so I started having Eric come on the show with me, yeah. and then he ended up coming on board with MRM, and he's been with me ever since, yeah. and uh, uh, now he's you, been you, a big help. You eventually moved to Salt Lake? 2004. Eric comes along? He came along later. Okay. Uh, not right away. <laughs> he came along uh, a bit later. Uh, he's been up here for a few years now. Uh, but he has just been uh, an incredible yeah. help for me. Well, he's, and he's, he's a go-getter on your program yeah. and, and everything. It's yeah, like whenever he comes up with a, I've got an idea. I, oh like, no! Uh, yeah, okay. You know, and yeah. he's got lots of ideas. So well, it's a great, it's been a big great help. ministry. Well, I wanted to ask you a few things. Uh, I, I know that um, things have changed a lot, maybe in the last 35 years, certainly, and it, it has for me in the last few years. But before you got started in 1979, there were a couple of things that were out there. One was Von Brody's book, No Man right. Knows My... Were you aware of that book, No Man Knows My History? I was aware History? of it, yes. I've never read it. Oh, that really? might surprise people, yeah. but I, I've never read it. And the only reason I've not read it is because that book did come out in 1945. Right. And there have been a lot of good books written since that time sure. that uh, I have read since, uh, only because they have a lot more newer information. A little more and updated in some yeah, areas. It's yeah. not that Brody's book is bad, because it yeah. certainly isn't. It's a classic. But I, I've always been one to want to know the latest that's going on. Sure. What, what is it that Mormons are learning now? Yeah. What are they hearing now? Mm -hmm and try to use a lot of that new information in my conversations sure. with Latter-day Saints. The, the book that I really poured over was Shadow or Reality. Sandra Tanner, Sandra Tanner's, Tanner's, Tanner's book. book. I, I have the copy I bought way back then, and it's all brown on the edges from uh, turning the pages. It's falling that. apart. I have it in a notebook now, <laughs> and even then it's all falling apart. Um, did, you I, ever, did you ever buy the index to it too? I, I later had to go when it finally index. came out. Yeah, yeah. yeah I remember it, when that came out. Yeah, it was very helpful. Yeah. Now, so, for some of us newcomers, uh, Gerald passed away a few years ago. Yes, you were able to meet him, I guess. And I, I did. Well, I, in fact, I first met Sandra in 1977. My wife wow. and I. Here again, talk about a woman who loves you. My wife and I, our first real vacation as husband and wife was Salt Lake to City. Salt Lake City. <laughs> and I spent most of my time at the Special Collections Depart uh, com uh, Department up at the U. Oh, you know, I, I left her at the hotel and the swimming pool, and I went up to the U and True was love. spending <laughs> hours in the Special Collections Department. Yeah, 39 years, she still loves me. So. Wow. But and you I, met Sandra and... I met Sandra in 77, uh, met very briefly Gerald at that time. Uh, he was always a kind of a shy guy. Was he? And, uh, oh, yeah. I, I talked with him more uh, other years that I came up and uh, had some very good conversations with him. He was an incredible man and uh, a great researcher. Was he happy to see you involved in this uh, activity in California? Did that hmm, I, I don't know. No. Um, I, I couldn't say that I ever noticed that. Yeah. Uh, now, Art Budvarsson certainly sure, was, was happy when he true. saw that I was getting interested in right. this. He was really my mentor in California. Sure. 
Uh, but my conversations with Gerald were more, uh, not very long, but more about certain things that he was researching at the time. Mm -hmm. And I was always fascinated with his, his research skills. Train, thank you. And uh, always fascinated with Sandra's research skills. Amazing, aren't they? It is. I mean, such a resource. And yeah, such I always a say I probably have a person. fingernail full of what she knows. So, yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah. she's an incredible researcher. Yeah. And, uh, well, that's a long train tonight. That right? is. Right. Um, well, that's, that's fascinating. And, and we certainly. I feel a, a great debt to her too in, in, in what she's done over the years and not realizing again for the last few years I, I know, or, oh, know of her but before that probably afraid if I had known of her I would have been afraid to even look so. Did, did you, let me turn the interviewer yeah, over here, no. did, when, when you were LDS did, did you know no. of her work? No. So you didn't, okay. No, never looked at it, Interesting. never heard of it. Uh, I knew there was some stuff out there, kind of like the track, that Christian track uh. society. I knew there was something out there, but never, never dared look. And um, I, I don't know what. Uh, I don't know I, if it hadn't been for for a Sean McCraney show gonna, and Doris Hansen's show that I would have ever yeah. even looked at that point, uh, other than the the changes that I did find out about in the Book of Mormon. But I don't think we can even realize over the years, uh, all the lives that have been touched by folks like Sandra. Sandra, and, uh, I know. I mean, it's going to yeah. just be incredible yeah. when we uh, I'm sure we'll be a realize. reckoning and, and get to realize you know, that. Well, and a lot people of are you still remember coming. me's? And, you know. People are still coming to her. I oh, mean, yeah. Just uh, even yeah. more so now maybe than ever before. So. There's been an incredible shift in recent years. Yeah. Uh, I've noticed it. Sandra's noticed it. But there's a lot of Latter-day Saints that are reconsidering their Mormonism, yeah, and I, I think a lot of it, as the church, the Mormon church has admitted, has to do with the free flow of information. Mm -hmm. There's no way that the Mormon church can hide this information from its people mm -hmm. anymore. And there's a lot of talk with these gospel topic essays about transparency, but uh, the, the problem, I think, for the Mormon church is, and I've said this on Viewpoint many times, I, as the problem is, is they have a bad product. <laughs> and once a person really finds out what the product is all about, yeah. Mormonism, yeah. it's not appealing. It's just not appealing. Well, and for those of us that were born and raised in the church, uh, you've heard a certain doctrine your whole entire life. And then when I started seeing the inconsistencies in some things, I tried to hang on to what I was hoping would give me some foundation and mm. some structure. And everything I went to continued to fall apart. Uh, whether it was masonry in the temple or the uh, book of commandments, the book of Abraham and some of those things. That's one I wanted to ask you about, the book of Abraham. That came along in 1967 mm -hmm. prior to, to your 1979. Were you aware the church had the papyrus and that kind of thing? Is that Well, I didn't learn all this till, of course, later, later. on, okay. but I was familiar with the book of Abraham and I was familiar with a lot of the problems with the book of Abraham. Yeah. Uh, I, I think the Book of Abraham is probably one of the greatest pieces of Mormon scripture out there because I, in my experience the Book of Abraham has probably caused more Latter-day Saints to start questioning their faith than any of their other books. It definitely was a tipper for me. Uh, well, yeah. I've noticed that when I do talk with ex-Mormons, I like to ask them what it was that got them to start thinking. Yeah. More often than not, it was the Book of Abraham. Yeah. And, and I can understand that because if it can be demonstrated to a Latter-day Saint that Joseph Smith did not really translate as they were led to believe, and that's what all Mormons thought in the early years, that he actually translated from the Egyptian into English. Once you can get a Mormon to see that it wasn't <laughs> a translation in the traditional sense, right. and that's what they're admitting now, right. If there, then the next thing is, is, well, then what about the Book of Mormon? Yeah. Because if that's not translated properly, the way we understand a translation yeah. to be a translation, then what about the Book of Mormon? And even though there have been some Mormon leaders who have talked about, for instance, the seer stone and the rock and, right, and right. all that, uh, the seer stone and the hat, excuse sure. me, the seer stone and the hat, I find, a still, I find still a lot of Mormons don't know that part of the story. No. 
Um, and now a Mormon apologist would argue, but we're not hiding it because you found it. Yeah, right, it's there. Well, I only found it because I was motivated to look. Yeah. Most Mormons no, I find aren't motivated. No, it isn't anything no. talked about. No. It may be there and, yeah. And it's always like as, as a sidebar. Yeah. Most Mormons still look at the translation, quote unquote, of the Book of Mormon, as being done by Joseph Smith looking at the plates. Yeah. That's how all the His pictures the, seem yeah. to paint them. The yeah. Ensign magazine and all the other sure. pictures. You do not normally see Joseph <laughs> no. Smith with his face in a hat. No. And usually if you do see something like that, it's not something that's produced by the church. Yeah. Uh, it's someone else who was just drawing that to show what it was like. And interestingly, they've changed the uh, I think they've changed it to the inspired translation with the Book of Abraham, haven't they? Instead yeah, of yeah, a divine. A I think divine <coughs> translation or something. Yeah. Which what does that even mean? Yeah. And which means he probably didn't need the papyrus, and yet no, he said he was translating them. He didn't need the papyrus any more than he needed the gold plates. Yeah. I mean, yeah. William Smith, Joseph Smith's brother, made the comment that when he was translating the plates. But then when he was doing the translation, the plates were nearby covered up. Yeah. So he's not even looking or at them. out in the forest or something. And he couldn't have been looking at them when he's looking at a hat. No. Unless you've got a pretty good size hat to <laughs> yeah. fit those plates the, that were six by eight in inches. Yeah, or something. You know. But, you know, a, a lot, and I don't know, maybe it was with the same with you, but a lot of Latter-day Saints, I find, just don't think about that. We don't. We really don't. We don't put two and two together. I think that's... We may have a little knowledge about different things, but we don't kind of put it all together. And when I started looking, the first vision, the accounts of the first vision, the Book of Abraham, and the changes in the Book of Mormon, then that's when I started mulling this over morning after morning and life after life, day after day. Yeah. Just, well now, if this happened, then what happened in 1820 really? You know, what did he really see in 1820? What what happened? Well, there? He know there, we know there was no revival in 1820, that's yeah, for sure. And so, <laughs> you know, started putting different things together. Well, a yeah. uh, couple of other things that did happen after you began your ministry. One was Mark Hoffman. Did yes, you, I did do you, remember that. That was, what, 1985? Yeah, 84, 85. You, you know, I was still in California, of course. Oh, okay. And, uh, but I was keeping very close tabs on the research of Gerald. Yeah. And uh, Gerald's research was incredible during that time. And I think that's one thing that I think shows the impeccable character. Integrity that of him, yes. wasn't it? Explain that a little bit. Well, what I mean by that is, you know, Gerald, being a critic of Mormonism, could have very easily just gone along with what appeared to Jumped be, on that bandwagon, you know, yeah. the, the, yeah. the salamander letters Brother, and all that. Yeah. But he was cautious, and he did not fall for that. He was a man who wanted to go where the evidence led him. Right. And so he was one of the voices that had a lot of reservations about all this. Now, I didn't really have a lot of opinions other than what I was learning from Gerald. Yeah. I'm not here. I'm not in the middle of all this at the time. I'm just kind of watching yeah. this yeah. from a distance. Right. But I do remember, and it was fascinating yeah. to see all that come about and, and really how the Mormon leadership were the ones that were duped. Isn't that amazing? And not Gerald. Yeah. I wonder... And, uh, in today's world, this was back in, the, like you say, the 80s, and on the internet, I don't know if that would change anything. Would you think more LDS would have been shocked at the, how the, I, how the I brethren know. were duped? I mean, here we are talking about prophets, seers, and revelators, or, or were they buying them just to cover them up, bury them? Well, I think the leadership was buying up Hoffman's stuff to bury it. We know that. Yeah. But I think as far as the attitude of the average Latter-day Saint, I remember bringing this up to a Mormon I was talking to in California. And his, his basic attitude, well, if everything hinged on what the leaders believed on that issue, you know, then you might have a point, but it's much broader than that. Oh my goodness. And so they were giving the leadership a pass, <laughs> which it was difficult for me to do that because if these men are really prophets and apostles of God, why are they falling for a con man like Hoffman yeah, right. or Kaufman? Yeah. Um, it just didn't make sense to me. You, you would think there would be a little bit more discernment in that. But yeah. no, they, they fell for it. Yeah. And, and the fact that they wanted to cover up what Hoffman was 
peddling yeah, that's, in the archives. That says a lot. Doesn't shows it? that they knew something was wrong. Yeah. And there is something wrong. It's it's huge uh, how wrong it is. Well, I, I kind of want actually running out of time again. I want to kind of end on a positive note here. Uh, you've certainly talked to a lot of Mormons. Um, what do you think they most misunderstand about Jesus? What do you think they most misunderstand? I think most Mormons misunderstand his grace and his mercy. Uh, we see time and time again in the New Testament, especially through the writings of Paul and his epistles, about the great mercy God has for us. Like in Titus 3, 5, it's not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he yeah. saved us. The mercy has to be undeserved. And even though I hear Mormons use the word mercy, and even though I hear them use the, words, uh, gra the word grace, yeah. it's always couched with something that has to be earned. And their leaders have said so. Some kind of a work. Oh yeah, um, when I was compiling uh, quotations for in their own words, we have several quotations in there where Mormon leaders talk about mercy needing to be merited or earned and grace needing to be earned. You can't do that. See, I don't know that an LDS person, again, it's, it, we don't, we're not thinking. I don't know what the problem is. There's a blindness there. Certainly. That, that is. <laughs> I would agree. Yeah, that is so, it's, uh, it's not even a subtle blindness. I mean, it's totally blind. I, mean, I, I read those words and uh, we say by grace after all we can do. That's inconsistent. It's it impossible is. to have both. And I think why a lot I, of Mormon apologists that? know it's inconsistent, and that's why they've been trying to spin it in recent years to make it say something that the church has never said it meant. Yeah. Uh, I mean, some apologists making it sound like, well, we're saved by grace in spite of all we can do. Yeah. That sounds evangelical. That's not Mormonism. Yeah. You know, so. I know you've done a, you did a, a, a interview to kind of a thing on uh, Brad Wilcox's uh, talk oh, yes. on grace. So. Uh, people, you should go to mrm.org. It's a wonderful website. They've got all kinds of links. They've got, the, they've listed all of the interviews that they've done, the Swedish Rescue, the Miracle of Forgiveness, um, Mormon Enigma. Emma Smith and Mormon Enigma mm -hmm. done a wonderful series of things there. And so, anyway, look those up. And boy, you know, you're following the Gospel of Joseph Smith and not the Gospel of Jesus Christ. Appreciate you watching. Good night. See you next week.